Okay, we're about to start. So thank you everybody for coming and um, just a few things before uh, the talk. Um, we actually do have, we're starting to have events, so you'll be getting our emails and you can pick up some flyers that are over there on the information table. Um, and you'll start to see more events populate on our website, so uh, stay tuned. And um, I just wanna say a few things to introduce this talk. My name is Samira al -Qasim. I'm the program manager here. And um, I do the film programming here. And uh, that's sort of why I'm introducing this. Um, this is a really interesting book, and we are selling it afterwards over there if you want to buy it. Um, it's interesting because it's so meticulously researched um, using sources that are from different languages, um, sources from Arabic film critics and historians, and but it's in English on this subject, so it's like a, you know one of its kind. Um, the subject is about the films that were made by the um, Palestine Film Unit of the PLO during the period of 1968 to 1982. Um, and it arrives, this book, at a, an interesting moment after two films that have come out in the last few years, um, Mohamed Yacoubi's Offering and Rona Sella's Looted and Hidden. Um, both of which use uh, material that had previously been thought to have disappeared, uh, material that was shot by the PFU, um, Palestine Film Unit, and had been thought to have disappeared with the Israeli invasion of Beirut in 1982. Um, so this book really does uh, fill in a, a lot of gaps and also has a really profound statement, and you have to read the book for yourselves, but one thing I would just say about it that I still find very profound is that it, the statement is that, you know, it's a revolutionary act for Palestinians to make films about themselves, and this was the idea of those who founded the Palestine Film Unit. So, and this connects the Palestinian struggle and Palestinian filmmaking to other struggles, and so it's really still a very timely issue. Um, but Nadia Yaqub, our speaker, will elaborate much more on that. She's going to read from the book. Um, she is the chair of Asian Studies, of the Asian Studies Department, um, an adjunct associate professor, professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Her research has focused on Arab cultural texts ranging from medieval literature and contemporary oral poetry to modern prose fiction and visual culture. Most recently, she has written on Palestinian literature and visual culture um, with uh, this book, Palestinian Cinema in the Days of Revolution, which you can buy afterwards, um, and the edited volume, Bad Girls of the Arab World, both of them University of Texas Press, uh, which was, uh, that last one was co-edited with R Rula Kawas. Um, and Nadia Yaqub teaches courses on Arab film, visual culture, and literature. So thank you very much, and please silence your cell phones. Thank you very much, and, um, and thank you, Samira, and to the Palestine Center at the Jerusalem Fund for inviting me. Um, I, I love to talk about this material, so it's wonderful to have this opportunity. And, uh, so what I'm going to do today um, is to read um, a few excerpts uh, from the book, and um, uh, maybe you can just tell me when I've read enough. I think I have about... 40, 45 minutes of material here, but if, if I'm going over, just let me know and um, yeah. Um, so obviously I can't do the whole book. Um, so I've chosen just a few uh, sections to give you a taste of some of the different ways that Palestinians themselves um, uh, and others working within the Palestinian, the PLO cinema, the various units of the PLO, the, the various cinema units of the PLO, um, uh, the various ways they made films, the issues that they grappled with. Um, so it by no means will cover um, the entire, uh, all the different kinds of solidarity filmmaking and so on um, that were done at this time. 
Um, so the first um, little bit I'm going to read um, is focusing on um, uh, the work of Mustafa Abu Ali. Um, and Mustafa Abu Ali was one of the founding members of the Palestine Film Unit, which eventually evolved into to the Palestinian Cinema Institute. You'll hear me using both those terms or their um, uh, abbreviations. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk about the founding uh, and their first efforts. You can read about that on the internet in about a hundred different sites. <laughs> um, but uh, I am going to I'm going to um, uh, start with um, a, uh, some discussion of a later film that he made um, during the Lebanese Civil War. Um, okay. Uh, in 1975, just as the civil war was beginning in Lebanon, Hani Jauhariya moved from Amman to Beirut to continue his work with the Palestinian Cinema Institute. In April 1976, he was killed by shelling while accompanying a Fatah delegation to military positions held by Lebanese and Palestinian fighters in the area of Ain Tura. Mustafa Abu Ali made the film Palestine in the Eye as a tribute to his fallen friend and colleague. The film consists of scenes of Jauhariya's official funeral, an interview with his widow conducted by Abu Ali, extensive footage shot by Jauhariya, including footage of the military operation he was filming when he died, an explanation from a military officer regarding the strategic importance of that operation, tributes from friends and colleagues, his commemoration at the 1976 Car Carthage Film Festival and the visit by Yasser Arafat to a posthumous exhibition of his photographs in January 1977. On the surface, the film appears to be a straightforward obituary of a well-known figure. Friends and family members and colleagues speak well of the deceased. His work and his dedication to the revolution are clearly and comprehensively explicated. However, as in Abu Ali's earlier films, uh, he manipulated the soundtrack and pacing of Palestine in the Eye to suggest different layers of grief and mourning. The documentary includes several layers of narration. An authoritative male narrator offers an official biography of Jauhariya near the beginning of the film and introduces its, quote, official segments. He introduces Abu Khalid, the military officer who explains the political importance of the battle in which Jauhariya was killed. Both the narrator and Abu Khalid speak in standard Arabic, the language of formal speech and official communication. This narration is quite limited, however, and much of the film's text consists of testimonies by those who knew Jauhariya well. The testimonies are given in dialectical Arabic, which lends informality, but also intimacy and authenticity. Most striking is a third type of speech, which appears periodic periodically in the film and consists of a conversation, also in dialect, between two men who discuss the footage as the viewer watches it. The men are never identified, but it is evident from the nature of their conversation that they knew Jauhariya and his work well. One is most probably Abu Ali himself. The conversation imbues the film with additional intimacy, in part because it appears to be a private com commentary on the scenes, as if a close friend were sitting beside viewers, commenting on a shared experience of watching the footage. The information provided is mostly details, however. Abu Ali makes strategic use of a lack of speech. The middle, fi uh, the middle of the film consists of emotional charged footage of Jauhariya's funeral and a long conversation with Hin Jauhariya, his widow. A clip from this conversation with sound appears near the beginning of the film, so viewers know that she is discussing Jauhariya's experiences filming in Jordan during the Civil War and the, difficulty, the difficult financial period he and his family experienced in the early 1970s. Later in the film, however, the same footage appears without her, eye, without her voice. Instead, for a full minute, Hin Jauhariya's face fills the screen. Her eyes are downcast as her lips move. I think I'm off. Sorry. Um, 
All one hears, however, are the plaintive notes of Mustafa al-Kurd's oud music. The camera pulls back to show that Hind is in a room with Abu Ali, whose head is also bent and who holds her hand tightly as she talks. Uh, Habashna, that's um, Abu Ali's wife at the time, sits in a nearby chair, and a sound man can be seen kneeling before Hind, holding a microphone just below her face. This is followed by another silent minute focused on the bent heads of, heads of Hind and Abu Ali in a mute tableau of shared grief and proffered solace. The lack of words accompanying these clips invites the viewer to concentrate on what is in the image, the personal grief, rather than the context in which it occurs, the funeral, cinema, and the revolution. It comes as a shock then, when the next scene is of Abu Khalid explaining the importance of the military operation that cost Johariya his life. The purpose of the battle was to thwart the imperialist plan to partition Lebanon as part of a larger Western goal to control the Arab world. He makes no mention of the liberation of Palestine. Abu Ali's intentions with this juxtaposi juxtaposition cannot be known definitively, but the contrast suggests the possibility of a distance or a space of difference between the PCI and the trajectory of the revolution. How does one productively enfold the death of a friend, colleague, or life partner into such a convoluted military strategy? These multiple forms of speech and silence create an open text that can be read as a straightforward tribute to a militant filmmaker or as a more complex representation of the multiple layers of meanings of revolutionary belonging and the necessary but also necessarily painful sacrifice. The film does not, does not directly critique the official revolution with its impressive pr processions, signing ceremonies, and military strategies. But the contrast between these images and the emotionally laden personal material creates a space for reflecting on the relationship between the larger revolution and the work of its cadres in the film unit and in the trenches, the men and women bound together by shared work and sacrifice. It is noteworthy that although Abu Ali's earlier film, uh, that unlike Abu Ali's earlier films, Palestine in the Eye does not end with an image of Palestinian armed struggle but rather with a display mounted at the January 1977 ex exhibition of Johariya's photographs. Between two Palestinian flags, a giant photograph of Johariya holding a movie camera is displayed next to an image of the PCI logo and a quote from the deceased. Through still and moving images, we can communicate and spread an understanding of the revolution to the people and safeguard its con continuation. The PCI logo consists of a rifle with a film reel on either side of the uh, 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 a rifle with a film reel on either side of the gun barrel and an olive branch emerging from the topmost reel. Earlier in the film, however, Abu Ali's camera lingers on the display of, of shrapnel damaged roll of film that Johariya was carrying when he died. The logo, gun film camera both deployed in the name of peace, declares the role of cinema to th in the militant politics of the PLO. The damaged, film royal, the damaged film role critiques the logo, making manifest the cost to the filmmaker, of course, but also to the images of militant cinema. Uh, the next passage I'm going to read um, uh, is, um, I frame this chapter by um, comparing Abu Ali's work with the work of Jean-Luc Godard and Massao Adachi, who both came, traveled to uh, the Palestinian refugee camps uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, and then went on to make quite famous films themselves. Um, and so I begin the chapter briefly with them, and then I end the chapter with them as well. Um, when Masao Adachi when Masao Adachi and Koji Wakamatsu arrived in Amman in 1971 to shoot Red Army PFL, uh, PFLP declar declaration of world war, 
they learned that a rift had opened between Jean-Luc Godard and the PLO with regard to the commissioned film Until Victory. Godard wanted to include an analysis of the events of Black September, but the PLO, anxious not to provoke the Jordanian regime further, disagreed, and the film was never completed. Adachi's accounts suggest that Godard was operating from a position of integrity. He could not complete a film he did not believe in. This also meant, however, that he could not create a film within and for the Palestinian revolution. Here and elsewhere, the film that Godard and Mielville, that's Anna-Marie Mielville, released five years later, and uh, they, they used the footage they shot um, in this film. Uh, uh, let's see. The film they released five years later is in part a film about both the futility of films like Until Victory within the global flow of images and Godard's admission of his inability as a filmmaker to perform the function of the and, the a, that fills the screen of the film at one point, that connects the here and the elsewhere of the title. Adachi also changed his film practice after his visit to the Palestinian camps. Our engagement with Palestine consisted above all in experimenting with militant cinema in the context of the struggle for the liberation of Palestine, while at the same time supporting the struggle in Japan in order to create a global solidarity in favor of armed struggle. At the start, we shared with Godard a desire to experiment with the new possibilities of cinema. The events, however, led us to reconsider the fund fundamental question of our way of working on the resolution of the problems linked with the development of a cinematic activism starting from zero. Red Army PFLP, like here and elsewhere, engages questions surrounding med uh, mediation and, the, and in particular television and the flow of images. With this film, Adachi adopted the, the form of the newsreel with the intent of creating an alternative revolutionary media circuit, Adachi engaged in forms of film activism, what Salanas and Gattino would have called a film act, whereby the film itself became an occasion to travel throughout Japan and engage in political discussion with young activists. He also screened the film in Europe and did at least one screening in a Palestinian refugee camp, but the results were strikingly different. I had a screening of the Red Army PFLP in a refugee camp, but when they saw it, they just searched for the dead relatives who appeared in the film and they would cry, touching the screen because they were missing the dead. The Red Army PFLP is about how to be based in a mass movement, but in Palestine already, the armed struggle was operating as a mass movement, so it was not necessary for them to see the film. The films of Abu Ali and the other members of the PFU and the PCI emerge in the gaps left by Godard and Adachi and their co-directors, the gaps created by the need for compromise and mourning that grow from within an active revolutionary movement. In Issy, Mielville and Godard me uh, meditate at length on the efficacy of dying for an image, the role that images crea created under such circum circumstances those of the hostage taking at the 1972 Munich Olympics in particular, and the potential circulation of images of the refugee camps through the always already compromised medium of television. Like that of Adachi and Wakamatsu, who in Red Army PFLP critiqued the practice of propaganda of the deed, a central concern of Godard and Mielville is the inevitable failure of the reception of such images by distant spectators. Abu Ali and his colleagues do not engage with the idea of dying for an image. Rather, they address the fact of dying for a community, of the necessity for the community to sacrifice its loved ones as the cost of claiming a role as a people in one's own history, and of how to create images communicating the existence and revolutionary necessity of such violence. Abu Ali's films repeatedly work to incorporate death into life in such a way that life and the political project to which the Palestinians were committed could continue. In some ways then, they are the natural descendants of the photographs of the martyrs that uh, 
Jadallah, one of the early founders of the, the Palestine Film Unit, created before the founding of the PFU. In Zionist aggression, Abu Ali draws a direct connection between the individual and collective mourning. In They Do Not Exist, he documents the role commitment to the revolution can play as a form of solace for those who have lost their loved ones. In Palestine in the Eye, Hin Johariya and Abu Ali's personal grief simultaneously infuses larger, more abstract and institutionalized revolution with the power and beauty of conjugal love and the personal bonds for forged over years of working together in the PFU, even as the film hints at the possibility of questioning the cost of revolutionary belonging. Films document this mourning, preserving it for the future so as to tie that future to the revolutionary present. They also disseminate these forms of mourning throughout the community, binding other Palestinians and their sacrifices to, this, to these losses. The films are pedagogical, instructing audiences in what it means to be a Palestinian and a form of ritual, allowing viewers to participate virtually in these acts of socially constructive grieving. Mourning invites into the co community of the aggrieved, not others whom one hopes to convince, but friends, allies, and co-resisters who watching the film sympathetically will be moved such that their commitment is sustained. The PFU and PCI filmmakers care deeply about Palestinian visibility. They hope to one day intervene in the global flow of images controlled by Hollywood and the media powerhouses in ways that Adachi, Wakamatsu, Godard, and Bialville had determined were not possible. In a 1987 interview, Qasim Hawal, who made several films for the PFLP, um, critiqued the films that he and others working within the PLO had made. We should have ignored the immediacy of events, reactions to them, and the enthusiasm, speed, and directness that accompanies them, he said. Howell here echoes a complaint that filmmakers had made about the limited scope of their own works from the early 1970s. If Godard, Mielville, Wakamatsu, and Dadachi are correct in their assessment of the political limits inherent in revolutionary <coughs> interventions into mainstream media then, perhaps Howell is mistaken and Abu Ali and his colleagues did the work that was most important and useful for the communities to which they were committed, Palestinians seeking to determine their own political future. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, the next I want to um, talk about uh, a type of filmmaking um, that was done uh, at the very end of this, the PLO period, short uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, um, before the Israeli invasion of Beirut and the departure of the PLO. Um, uh, and I'm going to focus on Monica Maurer, a German filmmaker who made several films uh, within the PLO. In the late 1970s, the German activist Monika Maurer traveled to Beirut to work with the PLO. Maurer was struck by the lack of films about the social and infrastructural achievements of the PLO. Fatah had begun creating institutions in its early days in Amman, and once the PLO moved to Lebanon, they set up needed services in the refugee camps, most obviously an impressive network of health services. Their work also included social services for the widows and children of martyrs, education and vocational training, garbage collection, and security in the camps. Maurer began working with PCI cinematographer Samir Nimr to make films about, excuse me, about this aspect of the revolution. Maurer and Nimr made two such films. They actually made several films, but I'll just talk about two. Children of Palestine, and the Palest Palestine Red Crescent Society. Children of Palestine, which won awards at the Leipz at Leipzig in 1979 and the Red Cross Film Festival in Varna, Bulgaria in 1980, was created in response to the declaration of 1979 as the International Year of the Child by UNESCO. The film takes the draft resolution on the rights of the, chi uh, on the, rights of the child, drawn up in 1978, as its structuring device. The resolution declares that each child has a right to a name and nationality, to life, 
to live, one's, uh, to, to live with one's parents, to protection from harm and neglect, to disability, to disability care, to protection from work, and to health, education, and time for rest and play. Children of Palestine demonstrates how each right is abrogated for Palestinian children as a result of Israeli violence, and how those abrogations are at least partially mitigated by the work of PLO institutions. The Palestine Red Crescent Society, as its title suggests, takes that organization, the medical wing of the PLO, as its focus. The film describes the growth of the PRCS, its various units, its, co its collaborations with other PLO organizations, and its plans for the future. It also documents the services it provides to the Palestinian and Lebanese people. Both films are informed by the Israeli invasion of South Lebanon in March 1978 and include extensive footage from the shelling and displacement of Palestinians and Lebanese. The film's main purpose, however, is not to explain or process this war, but rather to illustrate how the PLO serves its people in times of conflict as well as relative cal calm. Thus, while Maurer and Nimmer included, included extended passages of bombings in their aftermath, their films are most notable for the extensive documentation of life in the camps. Hello, Ellen. I just, <laughs> just saw you there. Um, she was there at the time that Monica Maurer was making these films. She was in Beirut. Um, Maurer and Nimmer, Nimmer filmed schools, orphanages, training centers, workshops, construction sites, offices, hospitals, clinics, and rehabilitation centers. They also filmed in camp alleys and homes. This detailed visual documentation of PLO institutions is unique among Palestinian films, and hence an important contribution to the archive of Palestinian images from the 1970s. However, just as striking is the subtle alteration this Vulcan gives to the temporality of the Palestinian revolution. Most films made by PLO filmmakers derive their efficacy in one way or another from an orientation toward the future. Whether they address loss and grief, the inhumanity of Zionism, resistance, or the beauty of a Palestinian rural idol, these films represent the Palestinian revolution as a movement whose promise will be realized in the future once Palestine is liberated. The effect of that, uh, of that movement on the present is characterized mainly by resistance and struggle, by protecting Palestinians from violence, but also by drawing them into violence, such that violence is defined as the path to regaining the homeland. Maurer and Nimmer's films also reference the hoped for future, but their works emphasize the revolution's transformation of a Palestinian present, both superficially by attending to people's present needs and radically by building a collective project through which subjectivities are transformed. Some of the footage in the films of Maurer and Nimmer, uh, uh, films of Maurer and Nimmer, resemble that of earlier UNRWA films. Palestinians and Lebanese appear as recipients of health care, education, and training. The difference, however, is that these patients and trainees are framed in the film not as the objects of charity, but as participants in the political body creating and operating these institutions. Maurer's Red Crescent film places particular emphasis on the rehabilitation of amputees and other disabled people, for instance, to illustrate not just the quality of care and services the revolution provides, but also its inclusivity. No one is dispensable, regardless of their physical state. Okay. Um, so now I would like to read a bit about uh, Qasem Hawa's film, Return to Haifa which is uh, the one and only fictional feature film um, that was made during this period. Okay. In 1981, Qasem Hawel succeeded in getting funding and the green light to adapt Hassan Kanafani's Return to Haifa to the screen. Howell's film was destined to be the first and last fictional feature film made under the auspices of the PLO in Lebanon. Howell was eager to render Return to Haifa not just a success as the first Palestinian, fiction, uh, 
fictional feature film, but also as a model for alternative cinema in the Arab world. Unlike many of his contemporaries, he chose not to address limited resources and expertise by making a small film, but rather to, rea to create something of a film epic by mobilizing a commitment to the Palestinian cause via enthusiastic volunteerism. The film includes a variety of indoor and outdoor scenes ranging from Poland in the 1940s and Haifa during the 1948 war to Ramallah in the late 60s and the Fidei training camp in Jordan. Most significantly, Howell recreates the Palestinian exodus from Haifa in April 1948 in an epic crowd scene shot at the harbor in Tripoli. The scene includes thousands of extras, dozens of boats, and aerial shots of the action. A lush score composed by Ziad Rahbani, action scenes including a desperate driving scene, battle scenes from the 48 war, and the Fidei operation at an Israeli checkpoint, and the use of color film all con contribute to the film's relatively spectacular aesthetics. Howell spent six months writing the script and planning the production. With the help of PFLP offices in northern Lebanon, where the film was shot, he recruited thousands of volunteers from among residents of Tripoli, the Nahr al-Barid and Badawi refugee camps, and the villages of Ehdin and Zgharta. PFLP members went door to door explaining the importance of the project and recruiting volunteers. Hanan al-Hajj, the Lebanese stage actress who plays Safiya, the lead female role, uh, held information sessions with women in the camps. Howell, at one point, addressed an audience at one of the local mosques after Friday prayers. According to the PFLP's own news reports, participating in the film was a meaningful experience for the Palestinian and Lebanese, Lebanese of North Lebanon. A number reported feeling a sense of accomplishment at the opportunity to contribute directly to a Palestinian national initiative. And for many, the experience of reenacting the exodus from Haifa, a lived experience for some of the older participants, strengthened ties to the Palestinian narrative by offering an embodied experience with recreating the Nakba. One volunteer named Ummazen reported that, quote, during shooting, I, I was really sick, but I ran. I ran with all the strength I had. I took my small grandchildren with me so that we could run together. We were all shaking with emotion, remembering our homeland and dreaming of returning to it. Some reported feeling so lost in the moment that they imagined the houses of Ihdin or Zgharta were their own lost homes in Palestine. The film follows the, the major outline of Kanafani's novel. A couple, Saeed and Safiya, have been living in Ramallah since leaving Haifa in 1948. In the wake of the 1967 war, they take advantage of the newly opened border to return to Haifa to see their old home. In Haifa, they meet Mariam, a Polish woman who's been living in the house they were forced to leave, and her adopted son, Dov. The child the Palestinian couple was forced to leave behind in 1948, Dov has been raised as an Israeli Jew and now serves in the Israeli Army Reserves. The novel is constructed around the protagonist's conversation as they drive from Ramallah to Haifa and the lengthy conversation Saeed has with Mariam and Dov. Howell fleshes out the story with scenes that contextualize the Palestinian narrative internationally. He includes footage of fascist rallies, the ransacking of Mariam's home in Poland and the murder of her child by the Nazis, as well as the murder in Palestine of a Jewish immigrant who questions the motives of, of those organizing the transportation of Jewish refugees from Europe to Palestine. This attention to Jewish persecution in Europe is significant, perhaps representing the first time this subject is treated in Arab cinema. Howell also highlights the efficacy of the Fidei'in by including a scene not found in the novel in which they, succe the, they successfully blow up an Israeli checkpoint and ending uh, the film in a Fidei camp where Safiya and Saeed's second son Khalid participates in military training. Kanafani's novel is already didactic, including meditations on the meaning of political commitment, peoplehood, and the homeland, on truth, ethics, and and political convenience, and on the reasons for armed struggle. Howell adds dialogue that renders the film more pointedly uh, didactic. 
The result is a work that consciously instrumentalizes the pleasures of spectacle and narr narrative for ideological education. Return to Haifa is a significant text, not just because it is the first feature-length Palestinian fictional film, but also because it is the first extended visual representation of the Palestinian experience of leaving Palestine in 1948. Samira Azzam and Ghassan Kanafani's fiction had offered a few early narratives, and Ismail Shambut's early paintings had focused on the feelings of loss uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war. Uh, in The Dupes, Tawfiq Saleh depicts a 1948 battlefield followed by scenes of, a newly displaced, of newly displaced Palestinians in a refugee camp. But no film as yet had narrated the exodus itself, the effects of the violence and chaos of the war on ordinary Palestinians and their desperate responses to those effects. At the climax of his film, Howell inserted a flashback back that extends more than eight and, and a half minutes in which both Safiya and Saeed's experiences in the chaos of fighting and the forced exodus from Haifa are depicted. Their personal stories from the, from the past are then connected to their psychological state in the present as they confront the, the occupation of their home and the loss of their firstborn child to Israel. The exodus is also contextualized within contemporary Palestinian politics. Howell was unfortunate, however, in the timing of the film's release. Its screening was postponed by the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, and the film was largely marginalized by subsequent violent events, including the Sabra and Shatila massacre in late 1982, renewed fighting in the Tripoli area, and the fratricidal camp wars in South Beirut, southern Beirut that occupied Palestinians in Lebanon for much of the mid-1980s. Return to Haifa premiered in Damascus, subsequently scre screened at the Carthage and Moscow Film Festivals, and aired on Algerian and Libyan TV in late 1982. In the early 1980s, it also screened once at a British university, but Howell was not able to show it to the Palestinians and Lebanese in North Lebanon who had worked to create it. Moreover, in the drastically altered circumstances in which Palestinians found themselves after 1982, the work did not enjoy the attention one would expect from the first Palestinian feature film. Adnan Madanat recalls that in the wake of the invasion and massacre, Arab audiences were in no mood for a film centered on a conversation between Palestinian refugees and an Israeli who settled in their home. It was one thing to read the, the polemical conversation among Saeed, Dov, and Maryam on the pages of Kanafani's novel, but quite another to see rounded Israeli characters engage in such a conversation with a Palestinian on screen. The film languished until Palestinian filmmaker Anna Marie Jasser selected it to screen at the Dreams of a Nation Film Festival in Jerusalem in 2003. Okay, and I have one last very short bit which is about um, Azal Hassan, who is uh, a, f a contemporary filmmaker. She started making films in the late 90s, um, and, uh, uh, and she's one of the contemporary filmmakers. There are several, but she's one who's had the most sustained engagement um, with this early material. It is in the works of Azza al-Hassan, however, that a connection is drawn between the ways that violence organizes representation of Palestinians today and the Palestinian revolution and its films. Al-Hassan is aware of the role the images she creates can play for future generations. At the start of her 2003 film, Three Centimeters Less, she notes that, archi she notes that archival importance. In her narration over a shot of a group of smiling boys, she says, my camera and I will soon, when these children are a little older, become their way to see themselves, to organize their world. Al-Hassan has sought to thwart or complicate these expectations in her films. She makes extensive use of first person narration. Uh, in, uh, sorry, I skipped a beat. Um, 
She is struck by how events in the Aqsa Intifada shaped her own work. Most threatening of all is the role, this is a quote from Azal Hassan, most threatening of all is the role which your society demands of you. The intensity of the experience usually creates a national illusion that the world must not know what is happening. It is the belief of the weak that if the world knew that it, th if the world knew, then it could not remain silent. As a result, members of an injured society develop an urge to inform the world. As an artist, you are expected to mobilize your medium of expression to tell the world, quote, the truth. People around you tell you, show the world what is happening to us. Al Hassan has sought to thwart or complicate these expectations in her work. She makes extensive use of first person narration in order to encourage viewers' awareness of the fu filmed and hence performative nature of the material. She asks her interviewees unexpected questions, eliciting from them not just unusual responses, but also different speech acts and demeanors. She also repeatedly raises the question of the human cost of the national struggle, and in particular, how much the children of revolutionaries are asked to pay when, when their parents devote themselves to the national movement. In Three Centimeters Less, she profi profiles Ra'ida Taha, the daughter of Ali Taha, who died while attempting to hijack a Sabina, Sabina airplane in 1972. Ra'ida was four years old when, her fa when he died, and although, as a Palestinian, she sympathizes with the cause, she cannot forgive her father for prioritizing his commitment to the revolution over her. In Kings and Extras, Al Hassan includes a section about Hiba Johariya, the daughter of PFU filmmaker Hani Johariya, who also lost her father at a young age. Kings and Extras is structured around a search for the missing PLO film archives, but the search is doomed from the start and Al Hassan's real quest in the film is for an understanding of the cost and value of Palestinian images. Who has paid what price to produce Palestinian films and photographs in the past and the present? And what significance do they hold for Palestinians themselves? Al Hassan's search eventually leads her to the Palestinian martyr cemetery in the Shatila camp in Beirut. And the film ends with her wandering among its graves with former PLO filmmaker Qaysa Zubaydi. In this last scene, the cost of image making is conflated explicitly with the cost of armed struggle. And I'll leave it at that and be happy to take your questions. Films available for viewing online anywhere? Um, you can see um, Mustafa Abu Ali's They Do Not Exist. You can see online, and you can see Masao Adachi's film, Red Army PFLP. Although I don't know if it exists with English subtitles. I've seen it with Italian subtitles online. Uh, it's in Japanese. Um, uh, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, you can see a lot of Palestinian material online, but, but a lot of the stuff from the early period you can't uh, from the 1970s. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, Nadia. Hi, Hi Peter. <laughs> I know uh, half um, the audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for having us. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the materials and you know h how you did your work in and uh, you know thinking about Rona Sella's um, right. trip through. Israeli archives and how yeah. much of uh, how how much of the <coughs> at least from what I understood a lot of the films produced were actually purloined right stolen from Beirut yeah. and taken back uh, to Israel and then buried in the Defense Ministry archives if, if I understand correctly well so I wanted to know yeah. what just your perspective on that yeah. which films you were able to see and and um, if this kind of idea that that uh, you know, the, the vast majority of film productions are in fact at least temporarily lost to us is a correct one. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because first I can tell you all, please, please, please read the acknowledgments because my work builds on the heroic efforts of a large number of people who've been working specifically on trying to find this material and restore it and circulate it anew. 
that um, really for the last 15 years, or more than 15 years, almost 20 years. Um, and in fact, the filmmakers themselves, Qasem Hawel, Qaisa Zubaydi, and Monica Maurer in particular, who've worked on their own materials um, uh, to try and get them properly preserved, restored, um, archived, etc. So um, it's true, in 1982, the PLO had about five different archives that they lost in the context of that war. Um, and some of that material definitely did end up in Israel. Um, and some of that material, maybe all of it ended up in Israel, maybe some of it got destroyed. Um, they're competing narratives, um, so we don't know for sure. And maybe some of it is still hidden somewhere. Um, uh, um, uh, and uh, Kings and Extras uh, actually goes into all the different sto various stories about where the films might be. But something to bear in mind is that the, what the archive had was about 100 films that the Palestinians themselves had made, the various organizations with uh, film organizations within the PLO, um, footage that they had shot that didn't make it into films, footage that they had bought or collected um, over the years. Um, you know, at a certain point in the mid 70s, they, you know, they started buying colonial footage or acquiring it in any way they could, for instance. Um, and, uh, and solidarity films. So a number of filmmakers would travel to Lebanon uh, to work with the PLO and then they would deposit a copy of their film there. When the PLO made a film, they, they didn't just have one copy in the archive. What they did is they sent it around to various film festivals. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the network um, of Eastern European film festivals is particularly important. So these films would screen at Leipzig Film Festival and then they would get bought for to show on television at various Eastern European um, uh, tele on uh, television. Um, and in fact, I have a colleague in religious studies, Juliana Hammer, she does Islamic studies, and she grew up in uh, Eastern Germany. And she said she remembers watching, the, this was the best stuff, all the third world stuff that was shown on TV because it was different and exciting, um, unlike the rest of, I, I don't know, East German TV, but from her point of view, it was kind of bleak. Um, so, uh, um, uh, and and they sent they sent copies of the film to cultural institutions. They traded films. So um, you know, some there were some films that got sent to Cuba, and then some Cuban films that got sent to the PLO. So the archives disappeared, but the films didn't disappear, and the filmmakers themselves kept copies. Not always, uh, oftentimes. Um, so Monica Maurer, for instance, you know, I saw it. She had like these giant piles of film reel um, that she brought. Um, she actually smuggled them out of Beirut on a ship that was taking <coughs> wounded PLO fighters to Athens um, uh, as when she exited Beirut um, in order to preserve the material. So the material is out there. Um, and it's uh, and the work that I build on is of all the people who've s spent so much time and energy looking for the film uh, and um, and gathering it. In particular, in 2014, there was a program in London called "The World Is With Us," which um, uh, there uh, um, sorry there were 33 films that were screened, and then these films were placed, there was a gallery installation for a week where these films ran continuously on about eight televisions um, in the gallery along with posters and um, things like that. Um, and that's where I got access to a number of the films. Um, that, that's, uh, I, some of them I had seen earlier. Th um, there was the work of uh, Emily Jasser working with Kaisa Zubaidi. Kaisa Zubaidi, one of the filmmakers, put together this mammoth filmography of Palestinian films. In Ara it's only available in Arabic. But he included a DVD with six films. 
on it. Um, and Emily Jasser had worked with him on that. And that circulated uh, to a number of Palestine film festivals. Um, so there was that. And then the London program were, were really my main sources for actually being able to see the materials. Um, and the London film program built on the work of all these other um, people coming before. You've spoken a lot of collaborations of these Palestinian filmmakers with uh, Europeans and Japanese. Yeah. So I was wondering, are there, during this time period, were there collaborations with uh, other Arabs or Muslims or sympathetic Israelis? Yeah, so, um, uh, so in response to the last question, during this period, there's not really much contact between, I mean, it would be illegal for an Israeli to have any contact with anybody associated with the PLO. Um, at this point. So you don't have those collaborations. But um, there was uh, an interesting project I read about, which was it's sort of the PLO, the Palestine Cinema Institute, work created a television series that actually I read aired in Kuwait. I've not been able to see it about the work of Felicia Langer, the Israeli human rights lawyer who worked with many Palestinians under occupation when their rights were violated. So you have, you have that kind of work. Um, uh, in terms of other Arab filmmakers, yes. Um, I mentioned Qasem Hawel and Qaisa Zubaydi. They're both Iraqi filmmakers. You had Algerians. You had Lebanese. Um, one of the chapters in my book focuses on alternative cinema in Syria because there's a brief period of time from 1968 to 1974, where the Palestine question really dominates uh, filmmaking, public sector filmmaking in Syria. Um, and part of that is the, you know, the rise of the Palestinian movement as this really energizing leftist movement for the Arab world. Um, a part of it, I think, too, arises from how much Syria hated Jordan and the competitions between Syria and Jordan. And you know, so uh, there was the Jordanian civil war in which uh, 10 or 15,000 Palestinians were killed and the PLO was kicked out of Jordan. Here was a chance for Syria to come in and champion the PLO as a challenge to Jordan. But be that as it may, you know, whatever you think of those politics, filmmakers on the ground were very engaged um, with the Palestinian question. Just made some amazing films, yeah. Sorry, just following up on the question earlier asked about your process of researching this book, did you did you go to um, to Jordan or did you go actually travel to I mean beyond England? Although maybe that was yeah. plenty because I know that this is dispersed yeah. material. But was that what was your experience trying to do that kind of research of going to Jordan or to Syria or even to Palestine or to Lebanon? Did you, was there a point where you were doing that traveling and trying to meet with people? Yeah, I did. I traveled a lot to Jordan and to Lebanon, not to Syria. Um, uh, and um, also did a lot of interviews. A number of these, the people that were active at the time, they don't live, some of them do still live in, in the Arab world, some of them live abroad. And I did a, a ton of library research at AUD and IP, uh, Institute for Palestine Studies um, in Lebanon, um, as well as some archives here in the United States. So I did a lot. I looked, I looked at every single Palestinian periodical that might possibly, and I went page by page, <laughs> spent hours, <laughs> um, and you know, for like little references to um, uh, film. To the to films, filmmaking, and so on, um, and the Palestinian, the PLO, they published a lot. I kind of wish they'd published less sometimes. <laughs> um, they published a lot, um, so I went through all of those publications. That, I mean, I didn't go through every single, th you know, the, I didn't go through their um, the Red Crescent journals, for instance, but um, anything where I thought there might be the possibility of a reference. Thank you very You're much. welcome. How best to use all this now? 
all of this research? To use the research? I mean, how best do it's you use all this yes. information you, give us, you gave us? Well, I think, um, uh, I mean, I think you can think about it in a number of ways. I mean, mo so, so most basically, I think for each of us in terms of understanding how the world works, and I'm, I'm guessing the majority of you, you because you're here, you're sort of interested in changing the world <laughs> um, and uh, you know, grappling for ways in which one can effectively do so. Um, and reflecting back on other struggles and other times and uh, you know, successful and failed projects, I think, is very useful um, in that regard. And, um, and thinking, I mean, we've got a filmmaker here, at least one, Joan Mandel. So you know, thinking about these films and what work they could do, it seems it would, I'm not a filmmaker, it seems to me it would be useful in terms of thinking about one's film practice today and you know, what one can and cannot do. Um, uh, I think, um, uh, obviously, this is a militant cinema. And so it's a, it's a filmmaking practice that was tied to a revolution that unapologetically advocated for armed struggle for national liberation. Um, and that, it seems to me, is a something, a, um, that still exists in the world, for better or worse. I'm, uh, and, uh, but it's, um, the, the, uh, its place in a global context of conversations about solidarity and decolonization and so on um, is quite different today than it was um, 40 years ago. But I also think it's changing, um, again, for better or worse. Um, and uh, so thinking about the image making in relation to how politics is changing how the world is changing seems to me is, is crucial. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have yeah. two questions. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know if uh, going through all the material that you uh, uh, explored, if the narrative changed between uh, the films produced in 1970 after the Civil War and uh, the movement of the revolution to Lebanon. And if it transformed, in what ways did the narrative change? How did they want it to represent themselves given the different context? And then my second question is about the representation of uh, Palestinian women. How did they feature into these uh, representation? You've mentioned one filmmaker, and I'm just curious to know more how uh, they played a role in all of this. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so <laughs> those are big questions. <laughs> um, uh, the the filmmaking changed a lot. Um, so you know, I mentioned Jean Luc Godard. Godard visited Abu Ali, Mustafa Abu Ali, and Hani Johariya met with Godard. Um, they spent a lot of time with him, and Mustafa Abu Ali's first film uh, with soul with blood is a very Godard like film. Uh, it's sort of a collage of different things, um, uh, very experimental. Um, and, uh, um, and you have other very interesting sort of experimental, uh, you know, sort of poetic filmmaking, essay, early essay type filmmaking going on early on. By the end of the 70s, and this is in the context of you know, global changes, um, political, and also in terms of um, film, filmmaking, political filmmaking, I would say, um, uh, at least in, uh, in the Arab world, um, uh, you start to have better production values, um, but also more um, uh, uh, films that were much more oriented towards providing information um, and uh, that were um, much more straightforward uh, in, in how they were constructed. 
um, films that would be easily recognizable to any of you. Oh yeah, that's a documentary um, about X. So that's just in terms of form. Um, uh, and it sort of parallels uh, development in politics in the PLO where, I mean, they, bega they began in, in Amman as really this kind of from the ground up um, outside, you know, the you know, Fatah group that then uh, manages to assume the leadership of the PLO and becomes increasingly institutionalized um, over the course of the decade. 1974, they get, you know, UN rep, um, observer, observer status observer status at the United Nations. At a certain point, there's um, uh, an, an, uh, um, uh, an expression of a willingness to negotiate. In other words, armed struggle and you know, total revolution is no longer the only what avenue uh, that the PLO will, cons will consider. Um, uh, so you have that development. Um, and, and you see that reflected uh, in, in some of the films. And I can just give you one example. There's a film by um, uh, Ghalib Shaz um, called Land Day, which he made, uh, he worked with West German filmmakers um, and West German cinematographers. So Land Day, 1976, Palestinians demonstrated with regard to land expropriations happening uh, inside Israel itself, particularly in the Galilee. Um, there was a very violent response to that. People were killed. Uh, and that became, so every day in March since then, that's, that's um, a day that's commemorated by Palestinians. So uh, these uh, two German cinematographers went to Israel. They could do that because they're German. Um, and they did all these interviews and then brought the material back so that uh, Ghalib Shaz in Beirut could create this film. And it tells, it narrates the events of Land Day and then also a year later, the commemoration and, um, and illuminates something about the, the status of, of Palestinians in Israel um, at a time when there was very little talk about this particular group of Palestinians. And it's a very, very different film. There's no mention of armed struggle in this film. Uh, it's, it's not incompatible with a national, an armed national liberation movement, but it's a film that could also uh, uh, be, you know, uh, work in, in the context of, say, the human rights film festivals that you start to have happening um, in the late 70s and early 80s. So you see that kind of shift as well. Um, so with regard to the representation of women in Palestinian film, um, uh, so you have women behind the camera. Salafa Jadallah, who's one of the founders and who was injured very early and therefore uh, had a very limited role um, uh, in the PFU. Um, she was, is the first Arab woman trained in cinematography in the Arab world. So, so she was there. Um, you had um, uh, Khadija Habashna, the wife of Mustafa Abu Ali, um, who completed one film and was close to completing a second film uh, when in the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. Um, you had, um, uh, oh, come on, how can I forget her name? Um, the, uh, 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 um, uh, well, anyway, a Lebanese uh, filmmaker who was trained in, in, in Cairo um, at the same, she must have Nabiha already, Lutfi. Nabiha Lutfi, thank you, Nabiha Lutfi. Uh, so she made um, a film in 1976, uh, Our Roots Will Never Die, the, the Roots Never Die, about the siege and fall of the Tal Zatar camp, um, which has, takes a, uh, a markedly, um, it's a very woman-centered film. So the siege is told from the perspective of the women in the camp. They, they talk about what life was like before the PLO came into their camp, into, into the camps and to 
provide them with services and protection, their relationship to the PLO, their experiences during the siege, um, including, you know, them, you know, pleading with the fighters, come on, let's give up, you know, we have enough uh, on earth, <laughs> now it's time to save lives. Um, and uh, so, you know, so women were not afraid to speak up, in other words, and that's represented in that film. Um, in, you know, I've seen about 30 some films out of the hundred or so. Um, and uh, I would say in general, women appear in fairly traditional roles. The exception being the solidarity films made by European filmmakers who I think almost every single film includes Leila Khaled, uh, who is a well-known leader of the PFLP, famous for hijacking two airplanes, extremely articulate, uh, and, um, and who did a lot of work also for women's education and so on. Um, so, um, so, so you've got footage, you've got a lot you know, of women, both this sort of second wave feminist type, you know, women should do all the things that men can do, um, and uh, other, you know, more traditional perspectives of women. And then I would say Nabiha Lutfi's film really stands out as a unique kind of, let's take seriously uh, the political and social views of women and their experiences. Any more questions? And just in passing, well, I'll let you say it. Um, thank you so much for this You're talk welcome. and also for your, your wonderful book. Um, building upon what you were just uh, mentioning, Nabi mm. Halutfi's film, um, something that you talk about in the book, which seems to me to be a kind of a, you know, a thematic and theoretical thread is the issue of trauma. And you talk about that in many places and yeah. also regarding Nabiha's film. Um, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate, share with us uh, in this room um, something about this, um, this uh, theorization of trauma, this, this idea that um, in the, the PLO films, um, trauma is represented in a non-fetishistic way yes. in many respects. Yes. Um, and that's very important. I mean, uh, non-fetishistic in the sense of, of how the images of death and destruction are contextualized. So uh, again, yes. I'm wondering if you could elaborate. Yes. That's so yes. important. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not an expert on trauma and PTSD and you know, the trauma as, a, as an actual medical, um, uh, a medical occurrence with, with, with physical and psychological after, after effects. Um, um, but um, I, I think one, uh, the, so the, the way, it, it seems to me, the way trauma is dealt with in the West is as an individual experience. I, you know, am nearly killed in a car accident um, and that, that affects me. Uh, every time I get in a car, I have a flashback. I can't get in a car anymore. Or so that's, you know, that's obviously an individual experience. But then, if you think about, I'm, I'm a fighter in Afghanistan or Vietnam. I'm a soldier, <laughs> and I have this experience with violence, and I almost die. That's not an individual experience. That's a collective experience that that soldier and the other soldiers who were there with him or her in, you know, would have experienced. So for the Palestinians, they dealt with trauma as a collective experience. And uh, um, again, I haven't read Palestinian medical literature where that may or may not have been articulated, I don't know, but what I see in, in what I have read and you know, the films and so on, it's that, so you have a collective experience with trauma, so you have a collective experience with healing from trauma. So trauma happens to communities and it's political. And so you find solace in communities and in political work. Um, and that's part of the work of, of the filmmaking. And I can give you one example of this um, which is uh, the siege and fall of Tel Azatar. This is in the context of the Lebanese Civil War, so this has nothing to do with Israel. 
Um, this is when the right-wing Lebanese militia surrounded this refugee camp in East Beirut, or actually two camps, uh, Tal Azatar and Jisr al-Tasha, um, held them under siege uh, for nearly two months um, until they finally surrendered and the Palestinians left um, East Beirut. And this was part of the ethnic cleansing of East Beirut. That was like the last non-Christian community, large community basically, to leave East Beirut. So in the aftermath of Tal Azatar, there were many orphans, many children without parents, um, and many women who had lost their husbands and sons as well. And one thing that the PLO did, well this was actually the work of the General Union of Palestinian Women, um, but it's hardly documented because they did not get to have any publications at the time that they were working, um, unlike everybody else. Um, uh, they created an orphanage where they took the children of Tal Azatar um, who had lost their families, and they took the women of Tal Azatar who had lost their families, and they created new families. So every woman was assigned to 10 children, and uh, they were housed. There was, there was um, a large building, um, so they, they had private quarters within the house, um, and they operated like families, but with other families that were the same as them in terms of the experience and this process of um, uh, healing from that experience. Um, and uh, that, that, that was called Beit uh, Atfal um, Sumud, uh, the, the, the house of, of the steadfast house for children. Um, and it continues today as an NGO, and some of the survivors from Tel Azatar work in that institution. It, it's now, you know, providing all kinds of relief for um, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. And when the PLO left Lebanon in 1982, uh, some of those children went to Syria, some of them went to Tunis, and uh, another Beit Atfal al-Samud was established in Tunis, and one of the um, girls who had been an orphan in Tal Azatar became a mother of children who lost their families in 1982. And so she replicated that. She was, she was a teenager at the time, but she became a mother and responsible for 10 children in Tunis. So here you have this, a social example of how you deal with trauma um, to, designed to, to minimize its traumatic effects um, and also keep a community whole. Hi, how are you? Um, Thanks. So I'm a film student. Uh, I, right now I, I go to a school in uh, Virginia and I'm looking to transfer to a university. I focus mostly on uh, cinema studies and uh, especially world cinema. Mm -hmm. and uh, aspiring filmmaker, obviously, um, but I'm also into film criticism and different things. Uh, my question is, is you mentioned um, people in the room having a desire to want to change the world, and you know, I look at film as a, um, as a very powerful medium that you can use to help people in different ways, and when you look at a lot of this revolutionary cinema, uh, a lot of it is, you know, showcasing these kind of stories, and you know, you see it in other countries from like Cuba and a lot mm -hmm. of the third cinema movement in Argentina and things like that. Um, what would your advice be for someone in my position who's an aspiring filmmaker as far as like, e like educationally or you know, uh, ways to get involved in different things like that? You know, um, you know just uh, maybe yeah. not sp specifically, but yeah. just a generalization of, uh, you know, is this like studying documentary film work, uh, things like that, you know, that's I think I, I <laughs> that's, Terry, do you have some ideas? <laughs> but, yeah. So Terry knows that world much better than I do, because I don't, I come out of uh, Middle East studies background. Um, I don't come from a film studies background, so I just, I don't know that landscape that well. But, um, and I'm not a filmmaker. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to talk today. Um, 
I had a question on, uh, you brought up the children of these revolutionaries um, and having to kind of deal with both mm -hmm. the consequences and also the future of this struggle and are there any up and coming um, or uh, popular like children of those revolutionaries uh, that we should look out for in film? Um. Well, I mean, Azza al-Hassan herself grew up within the PLO in Lebanon. Um, uh, I mean, there. Uh, I mean, there are, and Raida Taha, who I mentioned, is an actress, and she has a one-woman show where I haven't seen it, um, where she talks about her um, <coughs> her personal story. Um, so that's a theater rather than than filmmaking. Um, I mean, there are a lot of amazing filmmakers to watch, to pay attention to, but not, uh, but most of them don't come specifically from this genealogy of the PLO in Lebanon and Jordan and so on. Um, I'm working right now on a film festival that's going to be at Columbia University in April that focusing on Gaza. And so I've been looking a lot at what's happening there. And of course, Gaza is, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult place to, to do filmmaking because, you know, for all the obvious reasons. Um, but there's amazing work coming out of Gaza, including students, student films. Birze University, for instance, has a program in Gaza, a sort of branch program where they uh, work with students to produce films. Um, and, uh, you know, people who've learned filmmaking via, um, you know, television news uh, or internet news uh, types of works, total amateurs, uh, there's, um, uh, and, and, so for, and so for Gaza, I've never been to Gaza, but I guess you're just sort of constantly in a resistance mode in Gaza because you can't help be because every aspect of your life is informed by that, the, the, the blockade and the rep repetitive violence um, and the deprivation. Um, so, uh, and there is this movement going on now for nearly a year now where every Friday um, there's a protest at the, you know, the Great March of Return at the border um, and people are filming it. Um, so, so that I would say is certainly up and coming material. Um, but there's a lot coming from lots of contexts, um, within Israel, in the West Bank, Gaza, um, in Lebanon, um, uh, yeah. I think that we are probably approaching the end of our time. Does anybody have any, one more question? No? Well, thank you very much, Nadia. We really enjoyed this You're welcome. presentation. Thank you. We are selling books on the side. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>